For me, public education was a calling. One high school teacher, I went to Cascade High School, a teacher there had a profound impact on my life so many years ago, and it was my hope and dream to impact students' lives much in the same way that he impacted mine. My journey to educational leadership did not happen by chance. It was the result of many great leaders seeing a strength in me and propelling me to that next level. That's what great leaders do. Great leaders produce other great leaders. One such leader was my principal at Stevens Middle School uh, who encouraged me to get my administrative license. He mentored me and then encouraged me to apply for the assistant principal position there at Stevens. Sometimes in life, some of our greatest learning opportunities come as a result of our greatest failures. For me, that was the case, especially in my leadership journey. It was during a job interview for my first assistant principal position. I was in the interview, very, very nervous. Um, so far, so good. It was going well until I got to one question. What is your philosophy of leadership? I had no answer. And what do you do when you don't know how to answer? You say, can you repeat that question, please? <laughs> so they repeated it. What is your philosophy of leadership? My mind was completely blank. Nothing. I had no idea how to answer it. And to this day, I can't even tell you what I said. I, I, I don't know. I ended up getting the job, thankfully. Um, afterwards, my principal met with me like he always did. And of course, he always asked the question that I knew he was going to ask. Well, how do you think it went? And first thing I said is, well, I bombed the leadership question. Um, and he did what he always did and said, let's not start with that, but let's start with what did go well. And so we talked about, sorry about that. We talked about what went well, and then we got to the leadership question. And he gave me advice that I will never forget. And um, it was probably up to that point, the single greatest advice I had ever gotten um, from a leader. And he said, as a new leader, you must create a leadership identity. You must know who you are and what you will stand for as a leader. And then he talked to me about systems, the next greatest piece of advice, especially as an educational leader. You must create systems in your organization. If things come back to you, um, you'll burn yourself out. You will never be able to be all things to all people. You must create systems. So create your leadership identity and create systems. So then I embarked on my leadership journey. But that conversation in 2015 um, changed my life. And at that time, you know, you think about how does one create a leadership identity? Where do you even start? So for me, where I started was writing down the list of all of the leaders that, had, that I had had in my life. And um, I grew up uh, pretty poor. I had lots of jobs in high school, so I went all the way back to school. Those leaders, I served in the Navy, the leaders that I had in the military, uh, my time working for the federal government, um, the principals and um, educational leaders that I had had, I listed them all, and then I sorted them. And I thought, okay, who were the ones that I would classify as being great leaders? And then kind of middle of the road, and then not so great leaders. And one thing out of that process was very eye-opening to me. And I had many, many in the category of great leaders. And I had some in the category of what I would classify as not great leaders. And there were very few, if any, in the middle. And that taught me that as leaders, we must, um, we must learn and we must grow. And the impact is going to be tremendous when we do. But if we don't embark on that journey, there is an equally negative impact. And so what I did after that was I just started writing down, okay, if you're, if you're in my great leader category, what are some of the attributes or the characteristics? And I just wrote a couple for the sake of today. You know, not only the willingness to give feedback, but the willingness to receive feedback. You take care of your people. That was ingrained in me in the military. You take care of your people. Um, when you give constructive feedback, you do it in a way that extends honor to people and you value the con contribution, contributions of all members of your team. Leadership is not vertical. It's not me here as principal and then people beneath me, but rather we are here horizontally. If my custodian doesn't come into my building, my building doesn't function. And so we lead um, valuing all members of our team. And then on the flip side, the not so effective leaders, a top-down leadership style, ruling by fear, taking credit when others have done the work, telling people what to do but not how to do it. 
And so from there, I began writing out, I want to be the type of leader who. And I wrote out what I wanted for my leadership identity. And in education, we call that backwards planning. So we start with the end in mind. OK, this is the end. This is who I want to be. And then we start stepping backwards. And then it was, OK, now what? How do I get there? And that was a process. So for me, um, I read lots of books on leadership, like D. I'm a reader. Um, I interviewed lots of people that I considered good leaders. I, I just asked them questions. But most of all, I watched. And when I had people that I um, respected, I looked up to as leaders, I watched how they did the job, and I modeled after them. And one in particular is just seared in my mind. It was my principal at the time. I was assistant principal. And she did the best job of navigating difficult conversations with parents. And as a principal, sometimes we get yelled at. And, um, but having people come in who are highly escalated and being able to de-escalate them was a lesson that I learned from her. And on that journey, I got to the point where I, I hit this plateau. And it was a few years into my um, journey as an assistant principal. And I remember thinking, there's got to be more. Um, how do I get from here, and, and what's the next step? And yeah, I could read yet another book on leadership, um, talk to yet another person, but I knew that there was more. And in the back of my mind was Dee's leadership class. And I will admit, up to that point, I was a little bit um, hesitant. <laughs> and I think just because I knew that it was a lot of work and I thought about my time management. Um, but I got to the point where I ran out of excuses. And so I enrolled in it. And I would say that um, his course, by far, has had the single greatest impact on my journey as a leader. And it took my learning from this horizontal trajectory that I was on to this vertical trajectory that the sky's the limit. There are some very distinct differences about Dee's leadership class than others. Um, as you know, because you've listened to him, he does a beautiful job of weaving his um, entertaining personal stories um, into his sermons, um, incorporating um, his leadership identity. But the foundation of that class is not his personal thoughts and beliefs, but rather lessons that come directly from the word of God. He bases his teachings on God's definition of leadership. What type of leader is God asking us to be? From there, he weaves in scripture, um, incorporates daily disciplines, and once again, it's that backwards planning. Not my definition that I have come up with, but God's will for my life, and then what are those steps that are, that's going to get me there? Um, I just wanted to highlight some of the few disciplines that I've taken away from his um, class. One is my commitment statement, um, Proverbs 16.3, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Um, I can relate to Patty. I um, have a lot to say, and I write like I talk, so my commitment statement is quite long. It takes me a couple minutes to get through, and it's not memorized, but I do read it faithfully. Um, it helps me to start my day on what God's will is for my life and not the anxiety that I can typically wake up with as a principal thinking about all of the things that I need to do that day. Goal setting, Proverbs 21.5, the plan of the diligent leads to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. Um, if you've listened to Dee's sermon on goal setting, which I've done about 15 plus times, um, my goals now are like my goals 15 years ago on steroids. Um, I've written them multiple times throughout the year, and some of the takeaways for me, I've categorized them, and I start with the ones that are most challenging for me. My mental and physical health, that seems to always get set aside because I have so much to do. Um, I've categorized them spiritual health, time management, um, personal goals, professional goals. Um, one of the greatest takeaways from a podcast that I learned since his course was um, output goals, not input goals. And that has had a profound impact on my goal setting. And instead of, I want to lose 10 pounds, that's an output goal. It's, I need to drink 96 ounces of water a day. Um, I need to maintain a calorie deficit. I need to exercise and get my heart rate up. So just the, the, um, the skills and the um, lessons that I've taken from his class have had just a tremendous impact. Time management, Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. So then be careful how you live. Do not be unwise but wise, making the best use of your time because the times are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. 
I look at my time management much, much differently now than I did prior to his class. In the past, I used to think about my time as far as spending time. Now I invest my energy. There is a very, very big di difference. And I think about a flipped mindset, and I play these little games thinking about, OK, how do I work in daily disciplines? How do I work in my Bible reading? How do I work in my prayer? How do I work in my verse memorization? Um, one, one example is grocery store lines, and I don't know if you can relate, but you get to a grocery store, and you're strategically trying to figure out which line is going to go quicker, and then you get in the line, and then inevitably the other one goes quicker. And it's like you feel your heart rate getting up. And I thought about how many times during my day was I in so much of a rush that I found my heart rate getting up because I was trying to get everything accomplished that I felt I needed to accomplish. So that flipped mindset now is finding the longest line. And I think about, I've just bought myself five minutes to pull up my phone, to read over my verse for the day, to read the Bible for the day, or just to have a five minute conversation with my daughter and force myself to stop and just be present. And verse memorization, I touched on that a little bit. Um, Joshua 1, 8 through 9, study this book of instruction continually, meditate on it day and night, day and night, so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command, be strong and courageous. This has by far been the single greatest discipline that I have incorporated into my life. Um, as you know, in education, our, our students are not well. Um, COVID has had a devastating impact on the hearts and minds of our students. And, um, you know, when we think about the thoughts, they're coming from multiple places. Our thoughts come from Satan. They come from the Lord. They come from ourselves. They come from the world. But meditating on Scripture and memorizing Scripture has been the greatest tool for controlling my mind. And when I start going down this path of this is too hard, I can't do it, you come up with a verse, and then immediately it's a reset. It has been incredibly impactful. And then as I talked about as an educational leader and implementing systems into my building, um, through Dee's course, I've implemented systems into my life. The podcasts, um, he, he referenced John Maxwell, Craig Rochelle, Andy Stanley, um, listening to podcasts, having the apps on my phone, um, working those systems into my life has had um, tremendous, a tremendous impact on me. I've also been able to apply a lot of this into my building. Um, this year, I created a shared leadership model where multiple adults at Jefferson High School can take on leadership uh, roles. You push leadership to the deepest levels of your organization. Um, I am teaching a lesson on Friday to our student leaders, and um, we're doing a um, quote analysis on one of these leadership quotes and then analyzing that quote, but um, working very hard to try to produce the types of leaders that our world desperately needs. And then I would just say in closing, um, you know, when I talked about the fact that I hit this plateau and I didn't really have anywhere else to go, that's because my identity or my leadership identity was aligned to this world and to the worldly teaching. But with Dee's class, when you take this and then you flip it vertically, and not only did my learning take off, but when you align your leadership identity, identity to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, it is a whole different ballgame. God assigns identity, man does not. And then just in closing, um, for those of us serving in public education, it's a battle, and it's a fierce battle. Um, every year I um, come up with like a word of the year. I think last year in the dictionary it was like gaslighting, not in my vocabulary, but that was one of the words of the year. For me it was impact. And thinking about the impact that a really good leader can have on the lives of people and the impact that a not so good leader can have. And this year, my word is engage. We are in a battle, not just in education, but in our world. And as leaders, and as leaders who align our identity with God, we must engage. Thank you um, for taking the time to listen. Thank you, Dee, for an incredible leadership learning experience and opportunity. Um, I'm growing leaps and bounds, and um, I am one of these people who, um, I have a job where I work a long hours, and it's been impactful, that impact. But I am re-engaging because I understand that this is going to yield eternal results. Thank you. My name is Steve Sherman. Would you all stand with me just for a moment?
Yeah, getting a little stiff. I remember these seminars. Been to a lot of them. Raise your hands up over your heads. Say, Jesus, we love you. You are so awesome, Jesus. Thanks for loving us. Amen. You can have a seat. I, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm a former pastor and I haven't uh, been in the pulpit for 10 years, so I'm, I'm ready to roll. <laughs> no, it's going to be short but sweet. Um, I um, grew up in the Midwest. My dad was a pastor and I didn't want to be one because I saw everything that he uh, had to endure and uh, didn't make much money doing it. And I, I loved Jesus, but I didn't want to pastor. How many of you are pastors uh, or going into pastorate? All right, cool. So I, um, I tried to find other ways to serve him but not actually become a pastor. And the Lord brought me out to Oregon from Indiana. And um, I remember as a youth pastor at this uh, country church, sitting on the platform, I also led worship. And so after I'd lead worship, they'd have me sit up there and uh, I had to sit facing the, the people and while the sermon was going on. And I noticed that a lot of people were just nodding off and, and uh, it just didn't seem like the whole church thing was making much of a difference in their lives. And I, I knew he was calling me to do this, but I prayed and I said, Lord, please, please let me make a difference. I don't want to just go through the motion. And... Uh, <clears throat> so, I continued to pursue uh, and went on to seminary from that church. And I was in, in seminary when my wife uh, told me, you got to come see this pastor. Uh, her, her family had attended JBC. And she said, you got to come see Pastor D. His church is really growing. He's got a great discipleship program. And so I did. I came and met D sat down with him a couple times and really picked his brain because I knew that there needed to be some better way than just putting on a, a good show on Sunday morning, expecting people to come back on Sunday night and Wednesday night, you know, the whole ordeal. And, and uh, so I did. I sat down with him, and I was, I was so impressed by the discipleship program as he shared it with me. And it really fired me up as I was going through seminary. I thought, I've, I've got to do this. I've got to do this as a pastor. And so I um, um, graduated from seminary, got my first assignment at a, at a church full-time as an associate pastor, and they hired me to be a pastor to college people that was in Corvallis. The problem was they didn't have any college students attending the church at that time. So <laughs> they had lots and lots of young families. And so I was trying to recruit young people to come and start a college group and had some success. But what I really noticed was there were lots of young families, young couples. And these young men were precious men that loved Jesus, but they were kind of just floundering. They didn't have a good foundation, weren't following through personal disciplines. And so I asked the pastor, can I meet with, just offer uh, to meet with guys who want to be discipled? He said, sure. And I thought maybe I'd get five guys to come to the class. Well, uh, we offered 30 men. 30 men signed up for the class. Uh, I was stunned. We ended up having to have two different classes. That's too many for one class. And we had two classes, one met on Monday night and the other on Wednesday night. And it was beautiful. It was a wonderful time of, of being in the Word together and them sharing with me and me with them. And we learned and grew together. It was beautiful. I, as I went through that process, I got so excited to, to continue in the pastorate then. God had really changed my heart and mind about it, and I discovered this is, this is really how pastoring should happen. They need to be discipled. They need to be, men and women need to be helped. You don't just talk to them on Sunday mornings and hope they catch everything. They need to be shown exactly how to practice habits, put discipline in their life, and that's what really brings change. Developing right habits for godly living is what they needed. Now, other churches uh, um, 
will hope, the pastors will hope that their people are going to catch on and they love them and they're passionate about their ministry. But hope doesn't change people. Right habits change people. Right habits do. And that's what this class is all about, developing habits that will change their lives. So I had a great experience there. In fact, it was, it, it was exciting even when I left two years later because I was, I was anxious to be a senior pastor at that time finally. And uh, so I resigned from there. But last I knew, they were continuing what I had taught them, what Dee had taught me, just in meeting with them a couple times. I didn't get to go through the whole class. And these guys took off, and they continued teaching that class to others and others, and it was, last I knew, it was going great. But here's the thing. I became a pastor on my own, uh, was in a couple different small churches struggling and I tried to disciple. There were places where I, I tried to get this class, and they weren't interested in doing all that work that I was calling for. And uh, that was discouraging, of course, as a pastor. I, I'm hoping they really want to take hold of this and really go. I wanted to change when I first met D, and that really helped me change. But in the process of this, D, I'm an example of what you shared in this last session. I was one of those guys that I lost the accountability that is a crucial part of this whole process. There must be accountability. Otherwise, you know how it is. Life gets going and life gets busy and there's other demands and next thing you know, it's been another day and another day and you haven't followed through with these things that you know are crucial and important and they fall by the wayside. And unfortunately for me, that happened. Now, I was a passionate communicator I thought I did a real good job. I ended up years later past, uh, planting a church down out of uh, Roseburg, Oregon, planted a church, and it grew from, from uh, 20 people that we started with to 120 people within a very short time. Uh, we were having some real success. Our, our goal was reaching people out of, uh, that were coming out of addictive lifestyles. So it was, it, was, it was tough work in a whole different way. I was uh, the chaplain at the Douglas County Jail and so I'd get guys that were coming out of jail and out of these hard lifestyles, and um, I'd teach them these principles to some degree. But I personally had lost practicing them in full myself. And I got worn out at pastoring a church like that. I also worked three other jobs, part-time jobs. And finally, after nine years, I burn out. I'm one of those pastors. I, I didn't have a big moral failure. I just ran out of steam emotionally. I, I would see somebody coming that was a real needy person, and I knew they needed to be loved. I didn't have it. I was so tired. I was exhausted. Tried to get the uh, superintendent to come help me out. Finally, I, he, he didn't show, and I, I just called him one day, and I said, I, I'm, I'm done. He said, Steve, come on. Uh, I'll give you the summer off. I said, no, it's too late for that. I don't want to pastor anymore. I'm weary. And I resigned. Hmm. Still love Jesus. I uh, spent 10 years, the last 10 years, uh, I'm, a, I'm a mailman now, I deliver mail, uh, but continued to fill pulpit, pulpit for friends and uh, lead worship, even lead worship once in a while here. But the cool thing is, we ended up moving back to this area. And I thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to go hang out at JBC. And Jay, of course, he's offering the, the leadership class. And I thought, you know what, I need to re get refreshed in that. Jumped in the class just this last fall. And it's incredible, folks. I'm, but it's, it's so simple, isn't it? It's so simple. It is, it is purely seeking after God with all of our hearts, paying a price, sowing seeds for righteousness, investing in the word of God. What else can we do with our time that's more valuable? that will make more of a difference 
than being in the Word of God, memorizing the Word of God, discussing the Word of God with brothers, sisters. And here's the cool thing. After 10 years, I, I got a lot of healing during that time. But in the process of just this last six months of being in the class again and being reminded of how simple it really is, I'm pumped. I'm ready to get back into the ministry. God has healed me. He's healed me because I've reinvested in his presence, in his word, day in, day out. And now I'm excited about being part of an accountability group and I want to make sure now I know <laughs> I can't afford to skip out on that. I can't afford to do this whole thing on my own. We are clay pots. We carry this treasure, but we're fragile, and we desperately need what happens when we follow these principles are in the Word every day, every day, every day. May God bless you. May he help you to see the, the critical value, the critical nature of this. And may we all become really, really faithful, passing this on to more and to more, and see God transform people as they give him an opportunity by being in his word.